Good evening and praise the Lord once more. All right, we are on this evening going to do a succinct exhortation and spend the rest of the afternoon praying as a family. And so I ask you, if you will, to turn your Bibles to the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms. And we want to look at Psalm 44. Psalm 44. Verses 3 and 4. Very interesting passage of scripture, and um, we're going to use this passage for our exhortation today. Psalm 44, verses 3 and 4. As we turn to this passage, as you know, it has been my custom to give this usual disclaimer uh, there are lots of perspectives and arguments and positions on the Bible. So it's important to give a disclaimer on what we believe about the Bible, even as we use it to share. I believe in the supremacy of the Bible, that this book is the ultimate authority. In fact, it is the sole authority. I also believe in its sufficiency, that it is sufficient to make us wise unto salvation. And I believe in its summation or its totality that all scripture comprising the Old and the New Testaments only and 66 books only is God's inspired word. If you believe that, we mean say amen to God. Amen. So Psalm 44 and verse number Three and verse number four. The text says, For they did not gain possession of the land by their own sword, nor did their arm or own arm save them, but it was your right hand. It was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your countenance because you favored them. And the fourth verse says, You are my king, O God. Command victories for Jacob. Command victory for Jacob. Now, as you look at this text, at the top of the text, you see something called the subscription. At the top, you see to the chief musician a contemplation of the sons of Korah right under the title or the heading of the psalm, Psalm 44, you see, to the chief musician, a contemplation of the sons of Korah. Uh, that suggests the author or probable author of uh, this book or this psalm particularly a contemplation of the sons of Korah, as the text tells us. So based on verses 3 and 4, we want to reflect today on the message, it was your right hand. It was your right hand. Shall we pray as the Lord uh, leads us to study together? Father, we thank you for this 
immense privilege. We thank you for the blessing of Bible study. We thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit who inspired the Bible in its entirety to illuminate Psalm 44, verses 3 and 4. And as we study today, we ask that the Holy Spirit will give us insight for living. We also pray that today he be our prayer partner, our heavenly intercessor, will engage in this process of praying today so that by your grace, we will alter words that are consistent with your mind and your counsel by your grace. What we ask for today, Lord, will be in line and will be consistent with and will be uh, in consonance with your desire for us. Open our eyes this moment, we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen and amen. So the text of Psalm 44 the text of Psalm 44 says that it was a psalm, a contemplation of the sons of Korah. Now, when you study scripture, Korah is actually associated with the family of, or the sons of Korah are associated with the family of Korah, who was part of the rebellion against Moses. The rebellion against Moses. You remember uh, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram were the, the three guys who rebelled against Moses because, you know, of envy. Apparently that was, you know, uh, uh, colleague envy or peer envy, uh, you know, against Moses, the servant of the Lord. And so the scripture presents to us if you study the book of Numbers, chapter 16, the Bible tells us in verse number 1 that now Korah, take note of that name, verse 1, and then going further, Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and the sons of Peleth, the sons of Reuben, uh, took men. It means that these three people mobilized men. And Korah was from the religious family or the Levitical family, the sons of Levi. He took one of the sons of Reuben, who was from the oldest tribe or the tribe of the oldest son of uh, Jacob, and then Abiram, uh, the son of Eliab, and he brought some men, influential men of Israel, to rebel against Moses. And that rebellion was so serious to God that there were three critical actions that God took. Number one, he allowed the ground, the earth, to open and swallow several of those people. And then he allowed fire to consume some of them. And then he allowed uh, a plague to pursue the tribe of Israel, and several thousands were killed in that one day. But when we study further in the book of Numbers, particularly in Numbers chapter 26 and verse number 11, we find an interesting line of hope. And notice this line. It says, nevertheless, Numbers chapter 26 verse 11, nevertheless, the children of Korah did not die. Oh, wait a minute. When Achan rebelled, he died along with his family. But yet the Bible says, nevertheless, the children of Korah did not die. And ever since that moment, because of the redemptive act of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the sons of Korah committed themselves to sanctuary service. They were music leaders in the house of God. They committed themselves to the Lord because the Lord in his mercy spared them. 
the sons of Korah died not. So that is the group of people who or to whom this psalm, Psalm 44, is attributed. The sons of Korah who were spared by God. The sons of Korah who were preserved by God. The sons of Korah who did not receive what they, you know, could have. They became musicians in the house of the Lord. That's the background of that text. The background of that text. So the text says, For they did not gain possession of the land by their own sword, nor did their own arm save them, but it was your right hand. So as they re, uh, you know, uh, reflected on the redemption of God, the salvation that God had wrought for them, they wrote this psalm. They wrote this psalm to remind God's people about how he preserved them, how he saved them, not only as children of a rebellious father, but as, an, as a nation, the nation of Israel. And so very quickly before we pray, as we will pray today up to 5 you know, p.m., we will reflect on two points from this text. Number one, the futility of self-salvation. Number two, the fruitfulness of the Savior's salvation. The futility of self-salvation and the fruitfulness of the Savior's salvation. Now, look at the text with me. Verse number three. The Bible says, For they did not gain possession of the land by their own sword, nor did their own arm save them. They did not gain possession, and obviously he is referring here, or the, this psalm is referring to the promised land, the land of Israel. They did not gain possession of it by their own sword, nor did their own arm save them. It was not the military sophistication of Israel that gained them the promised land. It was not, you know, the number of persons who were fighting that gained them the promised land. He says it was not by their own sword, nor did their own arm save them. When they journeyed through Egypt and had to meet the Egyptian armies or to be pursued by them, it was not their own strength that made that possible. When they went and, and saw the Red Sea, it was not their own arm that granted them passage through the Red Sea. When they saw the river of Jordan, it was not their own arm that saved them through that. When they met the Amalekites, the Amorites, and all of these fierce forces and enemies of God's people, it was not their own sword that saved them, nor did their own arm save them. Friends, the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 17 and 18, then you say in your heart, now take note of this, my power and my might have gained me this wealth. God is reciting what these people were saying in their minds. My power and my own arm have gained me this wealth. Then he says in verse 18, and you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gave you power to get wealth. So he's saying it is not through your power that you became worthy. It is not through your strength that you got this wealth. Then in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse number 9, the Bible says, He will guide the feet of his sins, but the wicked shall he silent in darkness, for by strength, take note of that, by strength shall no man prevail. No man prevails by strength. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, the Bible says, For who makes you differ from one another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Wealth? Affluence? Uh, 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 you know, resources? Family? What is it that you have that you did not receive? Gifts of the Spirit? What is it that you have that you did not receive? So the first thing uh, from the text we see is that they did not gain the promises of God, they did not gain the promised land, they did not gain the possession that God gave to them by their own sword, nor did their own arm save them. 
the futility of self-salvation. We cannot save ourselves. We did not, you know, uh, make ourselves to come into 2024. We didn't. But then the next part of the text tells us about the fruitfulness of the Savior's salvation. The text says, but, but it was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your countenance because you favored them. You are my king, O God. Command victories for Jacob. Oh, friends, this text suggests to us how Israel gained the promised land. How the sons of Korah survived in the first place. How Israel became possessors of the land of promise. The Bible says it was your right hand in the scripture, the Hebrew scripture. Right hand is a symbol of authority. In fact, it is a symbol of unlimited power. It was your right hand. It was the unlimited power of God that made it possible. It was your right hand. It was possible because the God who preserved them, the God who led them, the God who protected them, the God who followed them in the wilderness or even went ahead of them in the wilderness was or is unlimited. He has unlimited power. He is unlimited in his power and his capacity to save. In Exodus 15 and verse number 6, the Bible says, Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, it is the unlimited power of God. God is limitlessly powerful. He has incalculable power. He has immeasurable power. There is no limit to his power, and that is what technically they call omnipotence, unlimited power. All powerful God. In Exodus 15, 12, the Bible says, you stretch out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. Just his right hand. He manifested his power. Isaiah 41 and verse number 10, he says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. And I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So he says it was the right hand of God that gained them the promised land. But that's not all the text mentions. Another thing, your arm. Your arm. Arm is a symbol of might and strength in battle. Listen kingly. The arm of God is the application of the right hand of God in the specific situation of his people. Now God's right hand symbolizes his limitless power. The arm of God symbolizes that power being brought to bear on a specific situation. God intervening in a particular situation. He says, your arm, your arm. In Exodus chapter 6 and verse number 6, the Bible says, Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the, uh, the burdens of Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. What God is saying, I am limitlessly powerful. I am all-powerful, but this all-powerful God intervenes in a human situation and he brings his power to bear on that condition and delivers his people. So in the situation of Israel, as they were experiencing the Egyptian bondage, this almighty God took notice of their situation, intervened in their situation, and applied his dominion, his power, his authority, and delivered them. It was your arm. The application of God's lim limitless power in the particular situation of his people. And then the text says, your continence, your continence. The word continence is a symbol of favor and a symbol of the presence of God. It was your right hand, your arm, the light of your continence. 
the light of your countenance. It means the favor of God. The favor of God. God favored them. The light of your countenance. The light of your countenance. Now, what does that mean? As Israel journeyed through the wilderness, Moses was instructed by God to tell Aaron, the priest, to go along with these people, to go before them. And Aaron in the wilderness was to be reciting what is known as the Aaronic benediction as they journeyed through the difficult terrain of the wilderness. They were to hear those words of Aaron in their ears. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Take note of the fact that that text is given in the context of the wilderness journey. They were to hear the ironic or the high priestly benediction as they went through the difficult terrain of the wilderness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. His countenance upon you and give you peace. In other words, may you find favor in the eyes of God. May you be favored by God. May the countenance of God's favor be, you know, uh, uh, upon you. The text says it was the light of his countenance that saved you. And then it says because you favored them. God's favor was on them. And that is why it was possible in the first place for them to have reached the promised land. Now let's apply this. We went through 12 months of 2023. Today, we are in the first month of 2024. How do you think you got here? Today, you have a job of your own. How do you think you got that? Today, you have a family of your own. How do you think that was possible? You have assets. So many things that God has blessed you with. You have life. How do you think you got that? The essence of this text, the essential message that the author wants to communicate to us is that we did not get here on our own accord or by our own strength, but by the grace and favor and power of God. For by strength shall no man prevail. It's not by might. It's not by power. But by my spirit, saith the Lord. So this day, friends, is the day of gratitude to God. It's the day of acknowledging his role in all that we are, in all that we have, in all that we are becoming. It's all by the grace of God.